Welcome to I Love It Here, a place where we discuss and share our thoughts on various topics, all focused on making life and work a better experience for everyone. And welcome to I Love It Here, a place where we try and support people with lots of little pieces of information through our amazing conversations. Your hosts today are myself, Caleb Foster, Paul Westlake and Jonathan Cooper. And I'm delighted to introduce our guest today, Andrew Thorpe, who is a bit of a travelling man, but also a professional storyteller. So without further ado, let's have a great chat. Uh, Andrew, for those people that might not know you, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you do it. Well, I decided some time ago that I didn't want a proper job, so I, I made one up, uh, and that is that I'm a, a storytelling coach and consultant in the business world. Um, and every, ever since I've made that title up, I see other people doing the same kind of thing. So it isn't so rare, but it's relatively unusual to do exactly what I do. So I essentially work with typically with technically trained professionals who are schooled in a technical discipline, which is the bedrock of their profession. But they struggle sometimes to communicate to people who are less knowledgeable than they are about their topic. And they, they need to find different ways of saying the same thing which is really what I mean by storytelling. It's it's how you frame a message in a more creative and an engaging way so it connects with the audience. So it doesn't literally mean telling anecdotes. That's part of it. And actually, if you get good at doing that, then that skill filters through into all these other areas of message framing. But it's essentially a, a, about teaching people or helping people develop a connecting skill when they're speaking um, out loud. I guess I would... Um... I would sort of, in my language, I would say it's like bringing something to life. And so I suppose that's the output of it, isn't it? It's the art of how you coach them to bring it to life. It is, it is very much about bringing it to life. And it's about the ability to paint pictures in people's minds so that they can see what you're talking about. You know, people say, well, I see what you mean. And they, they actually mean I can picture what you're talking about. Um, and I guess it came about to a large extent because I was helping people to present better because, you know, death by PowerPoint is a, a recurring and a persistent problem in the business world. Despite all of the books and the videos and the coaching we've had over the years, people are still, you know, yeah. it's still a problem. So it, but it dawned on me that in addition to the basic issues of, you know, too much information on the screen, reading from the slides, not looking at the audience, that the basics that people still get wrong. I didn't think that what they had to say was very interesting, <laughs> which sounds unkind. But what I mean is that they didn't do justice to how good their organization was, how good their product was, their service was. They did not bring it to life. They could describe to people what they did, but they couldn't describe who they were, which I think is a different thing, which implies the more sort of soulful human element of, let's say, an organization and a brand. Yeah. And, Andrew, what's the what's the end goal? Or, or does that or does that change? And I'll explain what I mean. So is this about teaching people how to negotiate, to change behavior? Is it about trying to maybe sell a product? Or is it just about doing justice to what it is they've got? I think it, it's about, it, it's a form of soft persuasion, I guess, right. whereby it is a selling skill, but it's selling that doesn't feel like selling. Yeah. And um, Dan Pink wrote a great book called To Sell is Human. I don't know whether you've come across it or not. Dan Pink's a great TED speaker and an author. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very much about what he describes as non-sale selling. So that when you're describing something, when you're painting a picture, you are sort of being softly persuasive. So the audience doesn't feel they're being pitched to or sold to, but they're warming to your ideas because they see themselves in what you're talking about. Um, and one of the phrases that I love, I think it was the head of the civil service or the head of the foreign office came up with this phrase. And he talked about the art of diplomacy, which I think is very similar to the art of soft persuasion. He says, it's the art of letting someone else have your way. 
<laughs> it's a really clever <laughs> phrase. Isn't yeah, it? That, to think about that for a moment. Yeah, that's that, really yeah. nice. <laughs> it, you know, as you're talking through that, there, I'm, I'm thinking what you've just described to me, to a certain extent, are. It feels to me like the advertising industry, to a certain extent, is going in that direction. And what I mean by that is, if if you look at an advert for, and I actually wrote down three companies actually while, while you while you were talking there. So, uh, first one would be McDonald's, which obviously I I know very very well. Um, I've been worked there for many 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 years, but it's unusual to actually see an advert for a product that they sell anymore. It, it's all it's all about. Here's, here's the lifestyle, here's what it's like, here's why it's fun, here's groups of people being together, it's fun. And by the way, we happen to sell burgers, whatever. Mm. I'd argue if you watch any of the, the the Apple keynotes, to a certain extent, they're very similar. It's very unusual for them to go into... If, in fact, you know what, if, if I was to ask out right now, I mean, if, if, you've, if you've got an iPhone, how much memory has that got in it? And I don't mean storage. I mean, so what's the, what's the RAM in it? Most people wouldn't have a clue. I I I wouldn't even know what chip was in mine, and I don't need to know. But what I do mm. need to know is why I need this in my life because I've been mm. sold that image of yeah. yeah but look how easy it's going to make things for you. And and the final one, which I was fortunate enough to work with um, uh, Rolls Royce Motorcars years ago, and and this has come up before on the pod as well. And they had a lovely phrase, which was. If, if if we ever get to the point where a client asks how much it is, we know we haven't done our job right because theirs is all about selling a lifestyle, selling why this I need this on my drive. And you know, mm. and if we even get to the point where they say how much is it, they're like, oh, I haven't sold that enough. So I, I'm picking up. That's the sort of is that the direction we're going in? Well, I think you're tapping into the into the field of brand storytelling there, right. where it's not really about the product; it's about what it can do for people. So you talk about the people who are using it and the lives that are that they have and how they're changed by using the product. And um, I've just actually watched the movie Air, which is in the cinema at the moment. Have you come across this film? Is this the one about um, it's, it's Nike, isn't it? And how they yes, it's the Nike Jordan. story. Yeah. It's, the, it's, it's the Air Jordan story, the, the story of how they signed Michael Jordan when it, it looked like he was much more likely to go to Adidas or maybe Converse. So Nike basketball were doing very badly at the time. They were about to go under as a division. And um, they really wanted Jordan to sign. And it's essentially the story of how they overcame being an underdog. In, you know, there were third out of three choices. Um, and one of the quotes at the beginning of the film, or maybe in the, in the middle of the film, is that a shoe is just a shoe until someone steps into it. Which I think Absolutely. is a really nice quote. Yeah. So it, it isn't the it's not the object that's the the source of the magic. It's it's when people step into it and what they're then enabled to do. Um, and in that case, they they created a synonymous relationship between the shoe and Michael Jordan by calling it the Air Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, in the same way, I guess, as a, a virtuoso violinist become you know the violin is part of their body. It's an extension of their body then because the relationship's very close. And so I thought that was a really lovely example of how it's not about the product, it's what it can do for you. And, and is that part of the, the, the and I don't, <laughs> God, blimey, keep, keep your powder dry, because you, I, I feel like you could just teach us all and we'll go, thanks very much, and now we've just killed your business overnight. So hopefully that's not going to happen. But <laughs> it, 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 is that part of the skill by me understanding what the audience want or what the person that I'm going to talk to for example you, you, is, is it about changing my approach and the story based on who that audience is and then if i don't know that audience i guess the second part of that question is how, how do i know that how do i know where i should be pitching this story well i'm gonna i'm gonna bring us back a little bit to where my area of expertise is because if we get into brand storytelling we're then veering into the field of advertising and marketing and there are, there are people much better than me to talk about that kind of branding and um, but where where i tend to work is in the field of ver i call it verbal pr so in other words when you're asked to talk about yourself your product your service your organization you're able to say something that really connects with people that resonates with them that gets under their skin but as in any situation where you're trying to be persuasive, it's about how well you know your audience and whether what you say really resonates with them and gets under their skin. So I, I've just run a workshop in, in Madrid for um, one of the big four accounting and consulting firms. And rather cruelly, I do a little thing with them sometimes. And I say to them, look, I've, I, before this workshop, I've actually looked at all of your LinkedIn profiles 
and four of you have used a phrase in your about me section which i think is potentially one of the most damaging things that you can say about yourself and it's, it's only five words long but could be viewed positively depending on how the audience takes it and then i just shut up and then i look at their faces and I, they're they're all thinking oh my god am i one of the four <laughs> and what's the phrase and then I revealed to them that I just made the whole thing up because I wanted to get their attention. So... <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just getting frantic there. I need to check yeah, on LinkedIn. We were all doing <laughs> it. We're running it to us. You can see that Caleb was quickly bringing up his LinkedIn. He, he had the edit button open and everything. <laughs> it's a bit mean. But that, I think that's a good example of how you, you, you've got to connect with people and say something that really does get under their skin and makes them sit forward and listen. Because they think, oh my God, this is this this could be about me. This could matter. Um, and you know, another method I think, if you're ever presenting to an audience and you sense that you're losing their attention a little bit, that that you know they're they're glazing over slightly, I might say, um, now Caleb, we were talking about this in the break, weren't we? And then Caleb thinks, oh my God, I'd better listen. He's using my name now. <laughs> and then Jonathan, who's sat next to him, thinks, oh my God, he might ask me next, so I better pay attention. <laughs> So that, that there's no better way to hold an audience's attention when they think they might be next or they're in what's being I discussed. I, I was, um, when you first said that it was sort of storytelling for for a technical audience, I was just thinking of like the, the CFO of an organisation and bringing their, what they were doing uh, to life and trying to, you know, how many chief financial officers would benefit from a bit of storytelling? But then I'm sort mm. of thinking, well, maybe that would have worked in Exxon and uh, Layman's maybe, but um, sadly not. Mm. Um, but that, that's a, is, is that an, sort of an example of a technical sort of role trying to tell a story or am I um, not on the mark with that? Well, again, it depends. It depends what you mean by story. So you you have... You know, the, the a brand story for something like Nike, it, 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 you have to know about how Phil Knight set it up all those years ago and started, you know, selling shoes from Japan and all the rest of it. There's the backstory. There's the, there's the, the Air Jordan story. There's the what Nike represents. So story in that sense is a very big thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's got lots of big, chunky concepts in it. But if you're talking about, uh, let's say you're giving a speech and you really want to hook the audience early on, you might start off with an anecdote that where where the audience is enjoying it, but they're thinking, well, where's, where's he going with this? I mean, I like this, but I don't know why he's telling me this story. Mm -hmm. And then once the reveal is done, where the speaker says, and I mention this because to me, this epitomizes everything that's wrong with this organization or where we need to go with this. So then we, oh, oh, this is, ah, right, I get it now. So in that sense, that story as an anecdote, but it's also part of a broader presentation, which in itself is a piece of storytelling in its entirety. So story or storytelling is, is a, a difficult concept in many respects because it means different things. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it is, it is about how do you make the audience see themselves and what you're talking about so they care and they want to know what comes next. And is, and is that, that about talking to them? Is, 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 that, is it as simple as that? Is it about talking to them at the and here's why it matters to you or to, to almost re, reframing it based on how whatever it is you're selling might might help them and and again i back in the day i i worked with um a, a, a technology company and and we'd take a couple of engineers along with us to a pitch and ironically i'd find myself doing that almost the warm-up bit so i was sort of telling people about here's here's a problem you might come up with and here's and then the the technical guys were just baffle them with this technology stuff mm. and i'd find myself almost jumping in going yeah but what <clears> that <throat> might mean for you is so i i feel like i'm almost filling in the story to make it sort of more relevant to them if that yeah makes it sense. sounds like, like you're again, trying to recover you're trying to recover exactly the situation that. with exactly. the sense that's that's that they're, good... they're they're losing interest you know i've got to bring that back a little bit now and and bring it back back about the audience and simplify things i think one of one of the difficulties for people who are technically trained i'm talking about people like lawyers accountants scientists technicians and so forth is that they have been schooled in thinking that deep 
technical expertise is what matters yes. and often they're having to pass professional exams to get accreditation and then they think right i've done it now i'm there but the trouble is that the people they're then engaging with don't have the same appreciation of all of that technical knowledge they have an issue they want to get sorted out and they don't need to know all of the technical stuff no, so i think a lot of people who've been schooled in that way feel that to give value they've got to give more they've got to get into the weeds and describe everything so an engineer for example finds it very difficult to leave anything out of an explanation because oh, it's not a full explanation i'm leaving yeah. stuff out but actually what you leave out it is probably the most important thing because that means that what you've left in really matters <laughs> and it can doesn't I... all matter equally to the audience can i can i ask a question andrew you focused on on um kind of communication from um one organization to another almost kind of outbound communication a lot of our conversations we focus on kind of making places making a place of work a really great place to work um can you share with us some, some 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 thoughts around things that we can do to to help overcome some of those barriers internally when we when we're talking between functions between finance yeah. and engineering and, and 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 where those different styles of communication that you've just described might make it difficult to work mm. together but again I, I think that you've got this siloed mentality within an organization you know where the technicians feel that technical things are the most important things where the marketing people thinks that marketing is the most important thing so you have a miscommunication within an organization as well where mm. the various departments don't appreciate the value that other departments are doing and the issues that they're facing and how the way that they behave affects those other departments so you've got a need in terms of comms to bring together those functions so that they have more of a uh, um, you know, a, a mutual appreciation of each other's work. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that within, I mean, where, where most of my work, as you've probably gathered, involves a better external message. It's for the marketing people, it's for the, for the business development people, it's for the CEO, the, the chief storytelling officers who are sending that message externally about building the brand and connecting with their audience. But I think there's there's an increasing role for me internally these days because you have to find lots of little micro stories within the business that show that you're living out the big picture, your vision, your values, your purpose. So you've got all this sort of amorphous blue sky terminology that the workforce probably don't really relate to very well. And they don't realize that the way that Janet served that person on reception the other day is an example of that value being lived out or well, that's moving us towards our goal as an organization so you need to find you need to be continually connecting the macro with the micro so in that sense a lot of that work is about harvesting little tiny stories within the business and making them relevant and showing how they fit into this bigger sort of jigsaw i think that's that's a real critical point there is recognizing those moments that contribute to those um you know business purposes elevating them so people see that and the best way to do that is as you say to paint a picture of it to bring it to life with the storytelling but those little nuggets of you know as you say you know the the person in the office has has done this thing and they're doing that thing because they're absolutely connected with the purpose. They might not even recognize that they're doing it and it's connected with the purpose. Mm. And somebody in the leadership, you know, everyone's a leader, but somebody needs to recognize that and go, you know, I know why you're doing that, why it carries on. Um, we just need to elevate it so everybody else sees it. Mm. For me, they're vitally important. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the, there are a few barriers, I think. So, for example, the person, let's say Janet on reception does a fantastic piece of work. She might not want to shout about it because she's she'd yeah. be a bit embarrassed. And she doesn't want to blow her own trumpet. Yeah. So it behoves someone else to recognize it and just to check whether she's OK for her story yeah. to be, you know, shared in some way, either internally or even externally. If it's if it's, a, you know, has got sort of marketing potential. Yeah. Um, but also you need to have that other person who's able to recognize the value of something that's done and just doesn't see it on the surface. 
So, for example, if somebody has given a really good, uh, let's say they perform very well in a, in a presentation or they've done very, very well at, at, a, at their first networking event, that might be a big thing for them because they've always been nervous about doing it. They've always shied away from doing it. So in storytelling, when you have a character who has a goal or an objective, but then something gets in the way and their own personal characteristics show us as an audience why it's difficult for them to get through those barriers, we need to know what those characteristics are because then we care more. Yeah. But if we just say, oh, someone gave a great presentation, well done. If we don't know that they've always been scared to death of giving a talk, or maybe they've overcome a speech impediment, then we don't care as much if we don't know that. Yeah, yeah, it's the it's the small detail behind that as well. I, I think we we often um, speak about great leaders, um, and uh, and the art of great leadership is to pick up on those things, to notice those things, to you know have conversations with that person. And you've almost preempted some of those challenges, but you know you're having these conversations always in the background, rather than quite rightly, as you said, just to go, yeah, that was good. Mm. And it's really understanding that you know that person and really supporting them through that through that mm. emotional mm. connection. It's like when you give a gift to somebody, if you know that that gift will mean a lot to them, because you know something about them then that gift is more personalized. It's much more powerful yeah. than if you just buy a bunch of flowers for somebody or a box yeah. of chocolates or a hamper, you know, for, for all the stuff. Let's do that for all the stuff. It's not it's yeah. not individualized, but it takes a lot more effort to get to know people to that level. But that and it's really interesting that you've picked up on that, because actually that's one thing that um, I've really connected with on this year is I've now gone from a, a and this is pretty broad stroke, but I've gone from a typical uh, manly position of, oh, it's Christmas, I need to get gifts, to I really enjoy gifting now because I early on connect with, I listen to the person, I want to understand more about that person on our conversations. And during that year, I find a gift that I think will connect with that person. And therefore it makes the purpose of gifting more enjoyable for me and you know there's a big smile on the face of someone when you present them with that gift because they go oh wow you know it doesn't mm. matter how big or small it is it's personal mm, mm, and there mm. was caleb and there was <laughs> and, and the gift is still still behind jonathan as we speak so do you know yeah. do you know what as andrew was going that through that i was thinking Wow, this is what you were talking about in the green room. I go bring up that gifting thing again. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I know how it works. <laughs> so Caleb made made very personalised gifts for us at, uh, at Christmas, and it. You're absolutely right. The, the the value, as in the monetary value, I wouldn't have a clue, and it doesn't matter. It absolutely doesn't matter. It, mm. it was the, the thought that had gone into it, and it, 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 in a sort of a similar way, I was fortunate enough to deliver. The, the last of a cohort we've done six six sessions um with a, with a group of managers and at the end of it their manager said oh can you recommend a book and i'll get i'll get a book for them all and that, that'd be sort of a nice way to sort of say you know congratulations on it and i said oh hold on a second I said are you okay for me to organize it because there's i've got some ideas but and i ended up i think there, there's 12 people in the cohort and i ended up ordering 10 different books as mm. in sub, one book was fine for, for two and then wrote a little note in the for each one and she said god i must have taken you ages you think yeah but you know what it wasn't just a, a blanket here's the same book for everyone i'd actually listen to what i thought each one of you and i may have got that wrong i don't know mm. but the feedback from them was like blimey you've really put some thought behind it yeah i think you're yeah. right it's, it is that it's knowing the person isn't it rather than just doing mm. the, the the thing Definitely. and all, all of those little touches um contribute to what i sometimes call the barrel of goodwill so right. the more you, know, you, you top it up over time and then obviously sometimes you might need to withdraw from the barrel because, you know, there's a difficult situation that you need people to pull together through. But it's all the little contributions. And also, I think the other the other kind of gift that you can give to people, it's not just a physical thing. It's also your time and your attention and your care and your empathy. So if people feel they've got that from you, 
you know, R Robert Cialdini talks about this thing of uh, reciprocity. It's a very hard word to say that. You can't say that after a couple of glasses of wine. Reciprocity, <laughs> this idea that once people have received something from you, they almost feel inclined to give back, although it's not, you know, on the surface necessarily as mm. a quid pro quo. So if you've given them your attention, your care, your empathy, your interest, you know, they will feel more inclined to give back to you. I wonder on that note, um, I wonder if we step into some gratitudes and then I want to come back to about um, seamless that uh, mate, absolutely seamless and, and, and loving a story. But I'll, I'll um, I'm going to kick off with some of my uh, gratitude that I've got for this month, actually. And it's so simple. It's it's really just taking a day out this uh, last week and going fishing with my son. I um so he was he was off actually last week and um his girlfriend who's a teacher was off the previous week. they didn't quite collide and he said to me oh I think I'm going to go fishing one day I said oh who's, who are you going to go you know fishing with because obviously I was just expecting to work and and thought he'd have a mate he went oh I think I'll just go on my own I went oh really I'll tell you what I'll clear my diary and um and I'll come with you. I've never been fishing with him. And it was uh, an outstanding day. Now, the only thing, um, I couldn't move a client meeting. So I had to have a, um, a team's meeting in his van while he was at the side of the, uh, while he was <laughs> fishing. And I, I kid you not, I was like 20 minutes into this Zoom call and he'd, he'd sort of run over to the side of the uh, van and he'd got this great big carp. And I went, oh, my God, he's caught a fish. And I turned the hat <laughs> on. And the only, I was like, okay, that's good. But honestly, just sort of down in tools as much as I could and just spending some time. And there was no great conversation other than we just spent time together, really. It was so fun. Mm -hmm. Who, who's got a story to share about their gratitude this week or month? Do you remember a couple of pods back? I was uh, talking about the chainsaw that I had uh, I had purchased and oh, made yes. work. Yes, you were you were um, I bought, renovating it. Away. You were bringing yeah, it back I to bought, life. I bought a chainsaw for for forty quid that didn't work, and uh, and it hadn't got all of its safety equipment on it. And I uh, I managed to find I managed to find a spare for on Amazon. It took me a while to order the spare from China for six pound. And I got this thing fixed, and I used it last weekend down on the allotment for the first time, and it was a dream. And I just hey. took, I had four hours, this, this this four hours of chopping chopping the tree up. Um, it was only a small tree. I haven't um, uh, had a negative impact on the environment. <laughs> um, but it was a, a just spending time doing that and, and having the equipment there that I had repaired made the whole experience significantly more... Uh, more enjoyable than it would have done if I had uh, just hired one from uh, from the tool station or whatever. I th I thought you were gonna for a moment. I thought you were gonna say my gratitude moment was in um, the nurses in A and E because it didn't quite go to plan. <laughs> I saw that coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> Jonathan, who currently is is showing off his love and hat tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Westy. What's your gratitude <laughs> moment? Um, you know, I, I had a, I had a week off, <laughs> and, and 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 similar to yourself, Caleb, I had a week off. Um, day one of my week off, my wife said, "Oh, I've got a few bits of work to do today." And both of the girls were saying, "Yeah, we've got things to do today, Dad." And she said, "What are you going to do?" And I said, um, "Yeah, I suppose I might as well do some work." She went, "No, no, no, no. Don't don't do that. Just seriously, what what, what are you going to do? Have something?" And I said, "Oh, I've got nothing that I need to do." And she said. What about that pinball place that you've been talking about? I was like, well, this, this is going to sound really sad, right? But there's a place called the Pinball Office, and I, I, I used to love pinball when I when I was a kid, and they they've got probably thirty or forty, like, I say old pinball machines, but they're completely spotless, and you you literally pay and you have a, a three hour session. I wasn't there all three hours, and all on free play, and it's not far from here. It's down near Stansted. So I went and did that for a couple of hours. So that was brilliant. Absolutely loved it. And then the second thing that I did is something I've been putting off and putting off and putting off. And I set up all these, they, they call them focus modes. So I set up all these focus modes oh, on, yeah. on my Mac and on my phone and, and everything else. And it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you think, 
I haven't got time to do all that stuff that's going to save me time. I know that sounds ridiculous, but we just put these things off. <laughs> so I've now got a focus mode for presenting, one for work, one for personal. Um, and you know what? It, it, talk about game changer. I, I'll, I'll have to use this terrible phrase of conceptual computing. So basically, if I'm, so, so, cut a long story short, if I'm in personal mode, I don't see any of my work emails. I don't get any notifications from Teams. All that stuff's there if I, want, if I need to go and find it. Yeah, yeah. But even if I happen to open my calendar, which I'll probably do two or three times, you know, every 10 minutes because I worry about missing something, the only calendar I'm looking at is the family one at that point. But then it works around the other way when I go to work and it changes. But not only is it changing that on my phone and on my Mac and everything else, it changes it on my watch. So it was the, the big one was... Um, I was getting Teams notifications. I thought, no, I, don't, I need these notifications sometimes, but I just don't need them when I'm not working. And at first, I had I had to wean myself into it, so I was setting them manually and all the rest of it. And I thought, I'm doing this at the same time every day, and you, you've got to love AI stuff that's saying, do you want to set this up as a routine? Because you do this at the same time every day. So now, 5.30 every day, this is going to sound really geeky, but 5.30 every day, I know my, my focus mode changes to personal. And how do I know that? Well, the screen looks different on my phone. The screen, the, the watch face looks different. The background on my Mac changes. And it basically says, you need to go and spend time with the family now. And I tell you what, it has been, oh, I've absolutely loved it. And if I miss something, possibly, but obviously not that not, the work. world's still spinning, right? Well, it, it it's been stop. fantastic. Absolutely loved it. I, I think there's a couple of things in there for me is that you, Everyone absolutely needs free time away from work because that's your recovery and recuperation time. And, you know, if you were a, um, a, an athlete, you wouldn't you wouldn't run all the time you've got no. and you wouldn't train all the time. You've got to have rest and recovery. So your brain's fresh. So, you know. The people I'm that say, I'm, just Sorry, work, I'm all there. about work, you've got to have that downtime, haven't you? Do you and, know what, last um, week, sorry, Andrew, you're going to have to wait a second because you know, I can't miss this one. I can't wait another month. <laughs> last last week was work time, but on Thursday afternoon, I went to um, Battersea, Bass, Bass, Battersea Art Centre to watch Portrait Artist of the Year being filmed. It was mm -hmm. like, it was, oh, it was brilliant. And they had like... Um, Rob Delaney was one of the people that was being painted and Ainsley Harriet and this guy called uh, uh, Rory Stewart. But anyway, and just watching a live TV or a live set, if you like, and you know what I'm like, I'm a bit geeky. So seeing all the cameras moving around and how they're doing all this stuff and all the editing and oh, I had the best day out. And I know everyone's looking glazing over going, that sounds really quite dull, but it was, <laughs> I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Everyone's got a paint a picture they want to paint. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> and I that's your picture, that. Wesley. Exactly. Over to you, Andrew. Is that is that Rory Stewart who does the podcast with Alistair Campbell? The rest is politics. Well, that's Rory interesting because I know he. Do, do you know what? I'm. I, I hope he. Did, I'm really hoping away he doesn't listen to this because I walked in. I was a trains were terrible so i walked in about 20 minutes late and they'd obviously done all his intros and there's this guy standing there and there's these three artists painting it i walked around and thought oh there's ainsley harriet well at least he's going to be quiet for a few hours so that'd be okay then i walked around the, <laughs> the corner and there's rob delaney and i thought well that'd be okay and then i saw this other guy and i thought looks like ap mccoy to me i think he's a jock no he's too tall to be a he's jock. a little, little no tiny idea. guy no guy. yeah no idea who he was until yeah. the floor manager said okay if we can all look this way just all look at Rory for a minute. And I was thinking, his name's Rory. Fine. You know, and and I, I sort of did the detective thing throughout the day to try and find out who this guy was. Yeah. And at the yeah. end, you're absolutely right. He had a pair of boots with him. I don't know if you watch portrait artists, but they have to take an, an article with them that represents something about them. So I easily mm. had like a cooking pot, for example. And this guy had a pair of boots. And I thought, well, he can't be a jockey. He's got this big pair of like Salomon boots. And he did a talk about, uh, he was saying about... Um, how he walked across Afghanistan and all the rest of it. And you're absolutely right. That's exactly who it was. Um, mm. It was that Rory Stewart. And he was former, a former Tory MP. He's, he's a really that's good him. communicator. Very, very yep, good speaker. That's the guy. And um, the Painted fact that he's on terrible. with Alistair Campbell, who definitely isn't a Tory MP type, um, means that they spark off each other very, very... They, they agree disagreeably, put it that way. Yeah. Sorry, they disagree yeah. agreeably. Let's get that the right way around. <laughs> 
<laughs> but that's who he was. So I came away thinking, oh, I found that. And again, you've got to love that because you come outside and you start describing. I, I, I think the, the, the I put into Google um, Rory Tall Posh Afghanistan. Yeah. And it came back and went, you mean Rory Stewart? Like, That's him. <laughs> the picture came up. Love that. Anyway, thank well, you. Caleb, you, you, mentioned, me um, you mentioned running. I'm, I'm going to choose the park run as my uh, source of gratification or gratitude. So I, I got into running in quite a big time in during the pandemic. Um, I lost my way a little bit afterwards. And I've started again, largely because I live very near to a park where there's a park run every Saturday morning at nine o'clock. Um, and I turned 60 in October last year, and I'm now obsessed with winning my age category when all the results are published <laughs> about an hour and a half after the race is finished. So during the race, I'm on the lookout for balding guys with gray or salt and pepper hair. And I think, Ooh, I'm gonna have you mate. So I've got to beat them just in case because i don't know whether they're in the category or not i make an assumption yeah, yeah. um and two two funny things happened I, I think on one occasion i did manage to get past somebody who i suspected was in my age category towards the end of the race and i'm feeling very very satisfied with myself and i'm charging along i got my head down and then all of a sudden i realize i've run the wrong way so uh, i should have oh. turned right to the finish line and i went an extra 50 meters during which time this guy overtook me no. So I wasn't very happy about that. Oh. And then there's lots of volunteers as well. And the volunteers often give um, encouragement, not just to everybody, but all, particularly the people at the back, you know, the <laughs> ones who go around about an hour plus. Um, and they're usually walking by this stage. So I did my time. I don't do a bad time around 25, 20, 24 and a half minutes, which is not too bad for someone of my vintage. So I'm, I'm there with my daughter. I'm walking off the course back to the house. And a volunteer says, come on, keep going. You can finish. <laughs> I've, said, I've finished. I'm walking home. <laughs> so, <laughs> so clearly, I don't look like the type of person who's capable of running to the finish. I obviously look like a walker. <laughs> did, did they have a moment where they went, oh, sorry. <laughs> they they saw the look, the look of indignation on my face. I think they got the message. <laughs> Have you, have you been a park run tourist yet, Andrew? Or have you only done your own park run? No, I've only done my own. Oh, okay. Honestly, if you... I, I saw... Jonathan, if, if if I could see you rolling your eyes as soon as Andrew mentioned park run... I wasn't run, rolling I'll, my I'll, eyes. I'll let you feel yeah. it. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to let Andrew know that park run has a special place in the podcast's heart because it was one of the first things we talked about. Yeah, and we, we we had a... We had a 30 minute conversation about the park run and the parallels between park run and work. And it was Westy that Westy that uh, brought it to our attention and uh, was extremely passionate about it on that mm. first podcast. Mm. Yeah. 137 for me last weekend. There you go. So I'm, I'm edging towards me, me new T-shirt, but no, they good. don't need it's to a great, great concept. in 250s. Oh, it's, it's a terrific it's, concept. It's just fantastic. Mm. Yeah, really, really good. Nothing wrong with park run. There you go. Thank you, Jonathan, for bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the other thing I found is if you're out running, why, why do you only ever bump into someone you know when you've finished? That's the most frustrating thing, right? You, they're, they're the people that drive past you in a car. You think, no, I've just done 10K and you've just seen me now. So all the time I'm walking back, they say you have to look at your watch every now and again, just tap your wrist because it looks like you've kind of just stopped. So you can mm. kind of get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> I really wasn't feeling it the other day. I didn't want to do it. My daughter said, no, come on, we're going to do it. So I said, well, I, I'm going to set out to do a personal worst today, a PW. <laughs> uh, but in the end, it wasn't that bad. That's not a bad time at all. I think because I, I set off slowly, I, I had enough energy left in the second half. So sometimes I go too quick to begin with. I, I've... Um... So I've got a treadmill as well at home and I really find that the using the Apple Fitness and the treadmill just gives me that time to decompress and get away from work as well. I think that there's a couple of things that I do for that is walk the, if I haven't mentioned him, Woody, he's probably asleep somewhere. Woody is the smallest dog on the planet. He's smaller than the cat. He's actually scared by the, um, by the wildlife in the park. Um, oh, we've we've got the uh, <laughs> no, we've got the guest appearance. 
Hello, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Why have you come past? <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> nice Hi. to see you. Here he is. Yeah, this is Tom. That's Hello, Tom. Tom. How are you doing? <laughs> have you got headphones Next on? Month, Tom, on. Tom, is a, Tom is a physio for Derbyshire County Cricket Club. No way. Oh, okay. Mm. Hoping so any, if you want to there, introduce I'll laughing my backside off for about the next 10 any minutes, aches and pains that you want to discuss we could include this in the podcast i'm not a remote physio he's not, a, he's <laughs> not, he's not <laughs> i don't get paid for that <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're telling us good. about woody caleb you've lost your lost your thread oh, i've lost me thread yes that walking the dog is a decompression and uh, and running on the treadmill i find but um, yeah, so it's just that mo that time where you can just forget about anything. But actually, it's a double edged sword, isn't it? Because when your brain's most relaxed, then you also start having those thoughts. Here he as comes. Well about, <laughs> yeah. just, he's oh, just walked in the back of the I don't there know about go. you, We've Jonathan. I'm feeling very left, left out. I need show. a Tom or a Woody, and they're not going to walk behind me Indeed. here. Cause... Indeed. I have just been reminded of something, though. Caleb was talking about um, Woody and the treadmill. Completely left field. Do you remember at the beginning of the year we said about having objectives for the beginning of the for for the next year? And I talked about dressing up and going to a classical music concert and how yes. I really wanted to kind of start to do that. And uh, and I uh, this this last month was the classical Sheffield um, weekend, um, and uh, and I went to two two concerts. During the classical Sheffield weekend, and I sang in the uh, I sang in the uh, the Winter Gardens with the choir that I sing with. Wow! Um, but to go to go to see Mahler's Fifth Symphony played at the uh, at the City Hall by a by an orchestra and choir of uh, of local people. A hundred people in the orchestra, two hundred people in the choir. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. I can oh, highly fantastic. recommend. Fantastic! That's that. very impressive. Very good. <laughs> I really wanted to pick up a thread uh, about storytelling and just yeah. that, that why do humans connect with a good story and love a good story? What, you know, what is it, is it at its heart? Um, I think one one of the answers to that is that the world is a, is a very, very messy and complicated place and stories are the way that we make sense of it. So we, we, I mean, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm not a trained psychologist, but I, I've learned over the years that we have all of these templates in our brains already. And um, so we recognize things like the fight between good and evil. We recognize, you know, things like a stranger in a strange land or feeling out of place. We recognize a love story or revenge or, or a quest. So if we see something that seems to fit one of those things, we're very, very keen to put it into that template because it's like a fast track. It's like it's like yeah. a, um, a, you know, a, a, a quick fast track to making sense of chaos. Um, and I think it, it also stems from, well, what they say is that from sort of um, caveman days, you know, when you when you had a, a twig that sort of you heard a twig break in the background, you assumed, oh, that's a, a saber toothed tiger. I better mm. run or take cover or <laughs> defend myself. So we make an association with something that helps us make sense of it. So that that's the root, I think, of, of why stories work. But they're just very, very good ways of painting pictures. They're very memorable if they're told well, because verbal storytelling is actually very difficult to do. Um, and when you watch the masters of the craft, like Billy Crystal, I think is one of the best storytellers around. He's just a genius um, and he makes it look ridiculously easy. And then you see someone try and tell a story and it's painful yeah. and you realise it's actually not an easy thing to do. Does it have to be true, Andrew? Um, uh, I, sorry, what... let me explain what I mean by that. Because I, I, back in the day working for a big corporation, we would all be presenting the same in quotes course and and, mm. and you know some sort of stories would come into that and go right now explain about how you did this this and you think surely that shows if it's not it must must be easier if it is something that you're you're telling a story about that is actually based on personal experience or can anybody tell a story 
Well, let me let me deal with your, your question about whether or not they have to be true. And it, it's yeah. probably the single most common question that I get asked. Um, if, if you try and make up a story from scratch, it's incredibly difficult. It's much easier to draw on an actual experience because there is this thing that, you know, truth stranger than fiction. Yeah. <laughs> you couldn't make stuff up sometimes. And they have, you know, it's a cliche, it's, it's a saying. And it's true. So it's much better to draw on actual experiences because then you don't have to think of making stuff up. But I think there's also a way of doing justice to a story by stretching it slightly, by okay. slightly exaggerating. Um, and that, I don't think there's any harm in that because it makes the story better. It makes it more enjoyable to listen to. It will tend to spread then because you've made it better. So it might be that what someone said wasn't exactly verbatim that phrase, but the essence of what they said is represented by the phrase that you use. So I think there's some natural embellishment or exaggeration that doesn't detract from the core truth of what happened. So if you said it happened, you know, you went to South America in, in the jungle and you actually went to, I don't know, Paris, then there's, there's a yeah. basic untruth there. That's problematic. Yeah. But, you know, if the creature that you had in your hand was was at least that long, then if it was actually only that long, it doesn't really matter because it was a bloody big creature and you, you felt yeah. it was yeah. enormous. <laughs> and and is, is there like a sort of a structure? So if, if let's say you were helping me to write a story, I say write a story, almost help me to frame a story that then maybe would become almost my lift pitch, I guess. So is there a structure on, on how that would work or is that different for each person? No, there's there's very much a structure. One of the one of the lovely things about storytelling is it follows rules. So you you have a classic structure whereby you you know you have a you have a context. You have to say if you start a story with say five years ago, you kind of know you're in for a story because of the way it starts. So mm -hmm. we've got the when, and then we might need well where are we talking about? Who's the character? Is it you? Um, you know what what situation were you in? So you have to contextualize the story to begin with. And I think one of the problems that people often have with verbal storytelling is they spend too much time with the setup and it gets too complicated. You can't tell, you can't identify the characters in the story clearly enough because they've added too many. And it also takes too long to get to the drama. So get us to the point where there's like an inciting incident or something unexpected. Get, get there quick because that's the bit that we really want to hear about. So you have the context, you have the, the character, which is part of the setup of the context. Tell us a little bit about the character. You know, are they, are they um, did they have a short attention span? Are they, are they uh, very nervous? Are they this, are they that? Just so we, we care a bit more. And then you have the inciting incident. What's the thing that happened that sort of turned their life upside down a little bit that they had to recover from and maybe overcome an obstacle? That's the so-called call to adventure when they go into battle, so to speak. Um, and then they have to face the challenge. Um, and things don't go to plan at first and they have to find a way of improvising so that they do eventually, you know, slay the dragon or, or uh, kill the shark. <laughs> <laughs> and so then there's a resolution, but then they look back at the experience and think, well, do you know what? I think I learned from that. And then they're obviously some kind of changed person as a result. So that that's a kind of a classic storytelling structure which works pretty much every time. It's based loosely on a thing called the hero's journey, which Joseph Campbell came up with in the last century, where he recognised his recurring pattern. Um, so at the end of the day, you, you need the context, you need who, who are we talking about, we need something to happen that's interesting, some unusual things, something unexpected, where there are consequences to what happened, and then some kind of resolution, because you've had to improvise and find some courage to get through this all. And then you're a bit of a changed person with lessons learned at the end. And I guess, as we said, touched on earlier, depending on the the outcome you would like to get from telling that story. So that could be, and I'm telling you this so you don't make the same mistakes, or I'm telling you this so that you will then go outside your comfort zone, or, or, or but you could almost use the same story for that. Yeah, I think the, the thing about business storytelling is there's really got to be a point about it. If you're just yeah. telling a story in the pub just to make people laugh, then there's not really any profound <laughs> lesson necessary. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just Imagine. for amusement. Um, but if, you, if you're telling a story in business, there's really got to be some kind of point. So I'll, I'll give you an example. There was a guy, I, I actually spoke at an event in, in Bucharest a few years ago. It was a marketing and branding conference. 
and the guy before me was brilliant. And you always worry when the person before you is amazed <laughs> that you've got to go on next. And I'll never forget how he started. He started off with a little story. He said that the other day, my eight-year-old son came up to me and he said, um, he said, Dad, we, we've got to bring your dad to school day coming up. And we've got to tell everybody in assembly what our dads do for a job. What is it you do again at work? And he and I said, I said very proudly, well, I'm a brand strategist, son. And he said, my son then looked at me very disappointedly and said, well, actually, I think we've probably got enough dads coming along. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so we got, a lovely, we got a nice laugh from the audience. But then he said, and it got me thinking. This is like a bridging phrase yeah, to get yeah. to the point. And it got me thinking, what is it that I actually do? And it made me realize that all I really do is I help organizations tell their story. And that was his opening. So it was very effective because... He basically took the mickey out of himself. So he he brought yeah. down his status. So he's not above the audience. He's like always one of us. Yep. But then he made it relevant by saying that, um, you know, and it's also very humble, I think, when you admit that a child has taught you something. Because yeah. normally wisdom isn't meant to go from older people to younger people, but it went the other way in that case. And then it was a lovely sort of segue into his theme. It was a way of bridging into his theme rather than saying, hi, my name's so-and-so. Today, I'm going yeah, to talk to you about yeah. branding and marketing. Uh, well, listen, I can resonate with that because my sons used to say, what is it you do, Dad? And, you know, when you try and explain what digital learning is, you get the same response, a glazed look. And, and again, the reflection on that is where I should have just said, I try and influence people to do something different tomorrow than they were doing today. And... But he would have still glazed over and said, no, just tell me what it is actually you do. <laughs> you know, do you knock nails in a piece of wood or stuff like that? Mm. But yeah, it's the same sort of thing. I um, I was also thinking, you know, that the structure for almost telling a story rather than just selling or telling, wouldn't it be a great way to visualise something as well, your future self? And I'm just thinking of all these corporate organisations that still have regular appraisals that everyone goes oh my god i'm dreading this and actually you've invested some time before going i want to create this story and i want this drama and i want to, to overcome this obstacle and you go into that appraisal going can i just tell you a story and this is what what how it's going to go and then you walk away from that going wow i just i've just told my boss what the future is going to look like with my appraisal very nice yeah very well. <laughs> Actually, there's a really interesting thing in you know, that movie I mentioned, uh, The Air, about the Nike yes. Air Jordan story. The, the, the story is largely around because Matt Damon and Ben Affleck star in it. And of course, they're great buddies. So Ben Affleck directed it. And Matt Damon plays the main character who's called Sonny Vaccaro, who was the talent scout for the basketball division of Nike. This is in 1984. And the the decision maker as to whether Michael Jordan agreed to sign for Nike was really his mother, Dolores. She was the, the key influencer. And um, because, you know, she, Michael would do what she said, basically. She's quite a domineering. Well, she's a very influential woman. And at one point, Damon's character goes to her directly to her house. which He wasn't meant to do, but he thought, well, I'll go straight to the source, not through not through his agent. And. Um, and he described, let me tell you what's going to happen when you go to meet Adidas and Converse. Let me tell you how the pitch is going to go. So he foretells future storytelling, hypothetical yeah. storytelling. What Nike are going to say, sorry, Adidas are going to say this. And when you yeah. meet Converse, they'll say this. And then it, it, later in the movie, you see the Adidas meeting and exactly this, the, the right thing happens that he's foretold. And there's a knowing look on Dolores's face and he's, oh, he's, he's got it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think hypothetical storytelling is very powerful as well. And that, that was an example of it. I'm just thinking we've had a couple of mentions of this, uh, this air um film amongst other things so maybe it's a good time to talk about our our, our playlists for this month so um are, are you on the board at caleb do you want to take, pick up first 
Oh, yes, I will do, actually. I've got a couple of things. On, um, I did listen to a book called uh, Life 3.0. Um, Don't do books. Have... Oh, listening to books. I was listening to books, yes. <laughs> Anyone that knows me knows I'm not a great reader, but I do listen lots to um, audio books. I really want to tell you who the name of the person was, and I should have been prepared for this. But I'll get back to it. It's Maxim, and he's a professor at um, at Stanford, I think. But he's um, this, this all got me into this about um, my fascination with AI, and so uh, Life three point is this evolution of uh, software and hardware. So Life one was this sort of single cell sort of amoeba thing where it's got no control over its hardware i.e its physical state or its software i.e its thinking and learning life 2.0 is where we are at the minute with humans so we can't change our physical our hardware but we've absolutely changed our software which is learn and grow and from mistakes and then the book sort of revolves around ai and the ability to adapt your hardware and your software so you adapt for everything in the future it gets a little bit deep and there's certain places in there that i'm sort of oh my god this is a bit over me but i love the concept and because i'm totally into the ai at the minute yeah and then the other one which is quite an old book but a nice simple read is leaders eat last which i'm thoroughly enjoying actually um so that they might Sinek. listen sorry say that again andrew mr Sinek. Yes, yeah, and it's just easy listening, really, that you can mm. really resonate, whereas Life 3, you sort of need some, um, you know, you need some capacity and bandwidth to sort of get your head around everything. Um, and then, so that was my listen and, and sort of, the other learn that I've got, actually, so I hate to carry on, but when I use Teams, if you ever use Teams or Zoom on client calls and you're trying to frantically scribble things down as well, it, it, it's all sometimes difficult to focus in the moment and write things down. So I'm using a tool called Fireflies AI, which is a plugin into Teams, and it does all of that work for you and it summarizes all the call and, you know, does a transcript. It makes life so much easier, actually, and records it as well so you can play it back. So... Yeah, my recommendations this this month. Microsoft actually have something um, <clears throat> on the insider builds of Teams where they've built their own version in, so sort of Copilot. I don't know if you've seen the same sort of thing, but again, it, I, it this stuff's just magical. And, and I guess you fall into one or two camps. You, you're either scared to death of AI and, and you don't like it and you've got your tin hat on and all the rest of it, or you're looking at the the possibilities. And, and I think part of it, the... The Teams example you use is a lovely example. The fact that we could have that running now and it differentiates between our four different voices and it picks up on what we're saying. And I know this just, but I, I'm very aware that what I'm saying, some people are like, oh my God, something somewhere must be listening to this conversation. Yes, of course it is. That, that's absolutely right. But the fact that it can do that and then play back to us at the end of that meeting. Here's a summary of that meeting. By the way, here's the here's the actions for Jonathan and here's what Westy said about it. Th that that sort of stuff for me here's is, the is sentiment. just mind here's blowing, the, right? Yeah, here's the key topics. It's not just a recording, it summarizes it, which is what you were gonna do. If it's a client call, you would have done that anyway. Exactly. So why not yeah. get AI to do it? And it saves you time. The way the way I explained AI and a lot of the software to Ben in my team um this week was it's like a, a super suit that people are using. So it doesn't mean it's going to get rid of people. It just means you've got a super suit on that's going to save you a shed load of time and it's perhaps going to do it better in some instances. At the minute, I really believe people's um, superpower is gut feeling and also the ability to um, empathise and tell stories and I've not seen anything compelling enough just yet in AI to go, that's going to replace that ability. So because no. most most AI is quite logical, it's programmed, whereas a human is quite um, quite the opposite, actually. It's irrational. It's emotion driven. And, you know, that's what makes us superhuman, actually. You know, mm. it's our superpower. There's so much discussion on LinkedIn at the moment about chat GPT um, and 
you know, its ability to, for example, tell a story. But whenever I read some of the stuff that's produced by it, it's quite vanilla. It's 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 very nicely written, but it's a bit dry because it's vanilla and it's not going to upset anybody. And then you look at a very, very skilled storyteller. Have you heard of David Sedaris? He's like an, nope. an American humorist. It's S-E-D-A-R-I-S, Sedaris. Um, and he's, he's done one of the Masterclass video series on, online. There's a thing called Masterclass where people like Martin Scorsese and Martin and Navratilova do, do things, you know, how to play tennis, how to do movies. <clears throat> and he says that when he meets a stranger, let's say he goes to an event and, you know, we, we're normally asked, oh, how are you? What do you do? That kind of thing. He doesn't like to do that. He asks an unusual question. <laughs> so he said, he asked this complete stranger once that he met at an event at a party. He says, when's the last time you touched a monkey? <laughs> and she looked, she looked at him shocked. And she said, I can't believe you asked me that because it was yesterday. <laughs> she worked in a lab or something, or maybe at a zoo or whatever. She went to the zoo. So she actually, so he touched upon something completely randomly that she was able to connect with. That resonated. Yeah. So no AI would ever come up with that as an opening yeah. question. When you meet someone, what, so what would be a good greeting for them or a good first opening? That's usually my entrance in the pub. Who's touched a monkey recently? <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds too close to be a euphemism. You can't go with it. You, you'd be out of that pub within minutes. Could, could be misconstrued. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Andrew, what should we be? Um, what should we be listening to? What should we be reading? What, what are you watching? Other than oh, air, I, of course. I've got to talk about a YouTube channel. Hey. Is that all right? Is that does that count? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Jonathan knows my interest in the game of golf. Ah. Um, Westian Caleb might, might not know that my brother is a golf professional. Um, I grew up and lived in St. Anne's in the northwest of England, which is a huge golfing area. Yep. He's 10 years older than me, so golf was my life from the age of 10. And I worked in the golf industry for 22 years before I started doing this. Um, and I still harbour a desire to fulfil my potential as a player because I got down to two handicap when I was 16 um, but I didn't get any better I kind of hit a wall um, and I turned 60 last year and I sort of set myself a goal to see if I could play better at the age of 60 than I did when I was 16 when all I ever did was play golf and start a YouTube channel of my own to sort of chart that story uh, and see how I got on also to do some interviews on the golf course with people who are similarly passionate about the game but happen to be very successful in other areas um, but the one of the 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 inspirations for this is um, that the world's most popular and viewed YouTube channel for golf is by a guy in Bolton just north of Manchester uh, called Rick Shields and, and Rick is a, a golf professional. He's not a great player. He plays to a similar level to me, probably a little bit better than me. Um, but he has two and a half million subscribers, wow. which is astonishing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think something like not far off a billion views for videos that he's been creating now for about the same length of time that I've been doing my current work in, in storytelling. So I'm We're a great admirer of what he that. does. And I think one of the reasons why what he does is very successful is to do with the the chemistry between him and the person he's playing with. It's very much the Anton Deck, it's the Laurel and Hardy, it's the Morecambe and Wise or whatever. It's the chemistry between the, the, the two characters in these videos. And because you follow their progress around the golf course and they're not great, they're good players, but they're not great players, the fact that they struggle a lot of the time makes it more interesting to watch. So we want them to do well, but we know that they're faltering from time to time and we can almost sort of vicariously play and enjoy a round of golf without playing ourselves because we watch them do it. And it's very alluring. It's I find it really, really interesting to watch. And he's very, very skilled at putting all of this together and a very likable character as well. So the other person, is that is he always on the 
on the uh, YouTube, or is it always a different person it, as well? It's he it, it quite often plays with his producer. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, who plays off about a four handicap, which is about what I am. Um, and but he doesn't always play with his producer. Sometimes he might yeah. play with a well-known pro, or sometimes he might play on his own. Um, but it's he's just very. He's, I really admire what he's done, and he, he was. He's actually been classed now as the twentieth most influential person in golf. Oh right, that's <laughs> fantastic, isn't it? That's How about that? God, but, he, I love that. but he's probably just having a giggle, isn't he? Doing yeah. the uh, doing the YouTube videos. Yeah, he's that's making right. a very very good living, and um, he actually played at Augusta the other day because the Masters was at Augusta in in yeah. April. And um, one of my dreams was always to play there, but he's, I, I've got to fulfil my dream through him now because he's done it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the challenge. Yeah. What about yourself, Jonathan? What, what, what have you been, uh, what have you been reading, what? looking at, listening to? Listening to, well, you may or may not be able to see over my, uh, over my, my, my right hand shoulder to, to your left. There's a, there's a, there's a turntable on my desk. I can, yes. So, so I've just been, uh, I've been, um, Slowly but surely, building up my vinyl collection, and my dad bought me a a, a double album um, of uh, the music of the Dave Brubeck Five um, for my birthday last year, and I've had it on the shelf and not listened to it. So it's really my first kind of uh, my first brush with uh, with jazz. So that now keep that that double album keeps getting swapped over, turned over every kind of every day. So I get a uh, twenty five minutes of that, and I'm really uh, really enjoying the. Uh, Extending my musical um, repertoire, I suppose. Mm. It's not something I've ever listened to before. One, one of the things I, I toyed with the other day about about an idea was to ask people what their favourite sounds were. So, for example, I, I love the sound of a glass of wine, be, the first glass <laughs> being poured. Mm. Yep. Um, but also, I love the sound of the needle when it just drops onto the vinyl. Yeah. And oh, you get yeah. that little click. Yep. And you know that the sound, the music's going to start in a moment. I love that sound. Yep. I think I it's like a... I, I like the sound that immediately after that. The sort of the, you know, like as if you've got a bit of fuzz on the, the crackle on the vinyl. That permanently got fuzz on that. It? <laughs> <laughs> it's really difficult to get rid of. Uh, do you know? I haven't listened to a a, a vinyl um, track for. Years, got to be years. You know what? I, I bought two it. records last week. Ironically, vinyl, exactly that. So we were watch, watching a um, a documentary about um, Britpop, and for whatever reason, I mean, towards the end of sort of the whole Britpop thing, um, the Verve came up, and my wife said, "Oh, do you remember you bought me this CD of you know Urban Hymns back in the day? You bought this one of the first CDs you bought me." I said, oh, "I don't remember that." And then she said, oh, we, we should... And I said, you know what? That's the sort of record I would put on the turntable and we would mm. listen to. J j don't wow. even flick through it on Apple Music or skip this one or I don't know this one. And I literally went and ordered it there and then. And it, and it came in as a... It's, it's come, it's come to, came last week and it's a double album now, which is weird. You think, well, no, it's not. It's only got the same amount of tracks. But on each record and each side only has about three tracks because evidently if you spread the... Um, I don't know, the, the grooves out, for want of a better phrase, the quality can be better. So it's, it's heavyweight vinyl, and they've spread all, the same oh. single album across double album, if you like. But you know what? So that, that means every three four, three or four songs, one of us has to get up and turn it over. <laughs> and, and there's something about that. First, it's going back to your point, that, There's something about joyful. that that is so much nicer <laughs> than just, just having it on loop play. I don't know what that's sad, isn't it? Uh... I love the fact that I can put one side of a, a an album on and I get 25 minutes. Yeah. And I, I know it's not too long. I can immerse myself in it for that long and then it's move on to something different. But it's it, it's really fantastic. Oh, we're, we're, we're going to have to continue this conversation, Jonathan, because yes. I've suddenly been... I'm now found well, myself in the, the time. position that I've hoped to be in for years, which is I can listen to vinyl via our Sonos system. So I bought a new Sonos, which I can plug my record player into, and it shares it throughout the house. And I, I've been avoiding that forever because it was always a really expensive option. And Sonos released something a couple of weeks back that had a, a line in, and literally the stereo goes, or the, the turntable goes into that. And being able to listen to a record in the kitchen is just oh, mind-blowing for me. Absolutely <laughs> loving it. 
absolutely love it's it. Got, so. It's got to be something that you're cooking quick, though, in the kitchen, right? Else you've got to quickly nip <laughs> back keep and turn back. It. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> That's so weird about that. And it, <laughs> do, do, do you know what? It, it, it's weird, isn't it? How we... Oh, the time's running on. Uh, how, how we um, accept things so quickly. But I did that, and one of my daughters went, oh, I see the sound's dropped out again. I went, no, the record is turning over. It's, it's not the same thing Whose at job all. Because it? it's like, was it stopped? Oh, sound's dropped out again. Is it done? Well, it's rubbish, is it? No, it needs turning over. So it's like, what? <laughs> Andrew, thank you for all that you've shared with us today um, about about storytelling. I guess the, the essence of what we've been talking about is about um, being human and how that fits into, 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 our, into connecting with one another and how the powerful way that stories um, play, play into that. Uh, you've shared with us um, thoughts about uh, removing the barriers in our, in our organisations by uh, spotting people who've done great things, who, who don't necessarily want to, to shout about it, but the value also of the person who sees that um, and, uh, and recognises it and, and how important it is not just to share the value of the thing that that person has done, but to recognise the human story um, behind that achievement. Um, we've talked about the value of, you've talked about the value of stories and how they connect us, the world being a complicated place and stories being a way in which we, we distill um, the very things that we do down to our, our feelings and our actions. Um, and in stories, um, we have the most kind of visceral way of connecting with one another. So thank you very much for your time. Um, we can be uh, we can be contacted through the usual channels. We're all available on, on LinkedIn. We have a Slack channel for the podcast. Thank you very much for listening and we look forward to seeing you next time. <music>